we are still constrained by the ideology of the Brussels Frankfurt consensus. This, these constraints are, are creating both a, a slowdown of decarbonization and are creating significant eco economic losers that are translating into a political backlash and a vote for far right parties across Europe who are promising to stop this climate nonsense because it, it penalizes working class people. And we have to think about how do we create some form of strategic planning. This is the reality of the, the requirements of decarbonization is that it cannot be done through market mechanisms. It needs a, a lot more state intervention. Good evening, and uh, let me um, let me start with a particular word of welcome for um, for uh, to to Johan and Anne Marie Muisken who are here, and in which uh, and we are going to celebrate uh, Johan's work today. So so I'm very glad that you're both here, and also to the speaker of this evening, Professor Daniela G Gabor. Uh, my name is Bart Holstein. I'm the head of department uh, of uh, the uh, Macro International and Labour Economics Department. Um, and I'm also a professor of human capital and social economics. Uh, it's a pleasure to be your host tonight for the Johan Muiske Lecture. Um, the aim of this yearly event is to honor the work of Johan. Um, he played a key role for, for building our school of business and economics. Um, he was also the first professor of economics at this school and was the founding father of the Department of Economics. He also served as the dean of our school, so we're very glad to, to have him here. This uh, annual lecture was initiated uh, as a tribute to him and at the occasion of his retirement. And after his retirement, he has remained very active as a researcher, and I'm pleased to have, have you here tonight. Um, in his research, Johan combines deep theoretical insights with applied research. He has a keen eye for the resulting policy implications and has a strong preference for non-orthodox, non-mainstream economic thinking. This eighth Johan Muiske lecture will be delivered, delivered by Professor Daniela Gabor. Um, she's an economist who perfectly fits our series because of her work on critical macrofinance. Before I briefly introduce Professor Gabor to you, I would like to extend special thanks also to Studium Generale, and his representative, Jaap Janssen. Studium Generale is a highly appreciated co-organizer co of our annual lecture. Also, thanks go out to Tom van Veen and our secretariat for making this lecture possible. So let me now briefly introduce our, our guest for, for tonight. Professor Gabor is Professor of Economics and Macrofinance at the University of West England in Bristol. She received her PhD, which focused on monetary policy processes in 2009 at the University of Stirling. This academic year, Professor Gabor is a research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. Her research develops three main, three related themes under the umbrella of critical macrofinance. First, she's interested in shadow banking activities, in particular repo markets, and the implications for monetary theory, central banking, sovereign bond markets, and regulatory activity. If I'm forgetting something, you should mention this. <laughs> uh, second, her research develops the theme of transnational banks' involvement in policy deliberations around capital controls and crisis management in both global settings and in emerging markets. Third, her research focuses on the IMFs, conditionality and advice on capital controls. Today, Professor Gabor will give a lecture on a slightly different topic, uh, namely green capitalism and its discontents. The lecture will take approximately one hour, as I said before, and afterwards, brief uh, uh, round of questions, like half an hour, and then we retreat to the rafter. So, Professor, we are happy to have you here and look forward to your lecture. Thank you. As you can see, this podium was for me. <laughs> I'm little. 
let me start by thanking the organizers. Um, it is a great honor to be here, and it, uh, it's a great honor to celebrate the institutional and, and intellectual contributions uh, of Jan. Um, I am going to talk to you about work that I've been doing over the last three to four years that looks at the ways in which uh, we have to think about um, decarbonization strategies and about um, um, the role of the state in, in this process. Um, I will probably dis not disappoint you by not talking about repo markets. Uh, they're very technical and there is a very interesting political economy behind them, but uh, it would come with balance sheets and I think this is the, one of the first times when I don't draw assets and liabilities for a presentation. So, um, I was told that the audience is broad, um, so I'm, I'm going to try to keep my remarks as, as um, um, accessible as possible. Um, I hope to get questions at the end for, for clarification. I'm going to be a little bit provocative in that, in that spirit to stimulate some debate. Um, please take it in that, uh, my, my remarks in that sense. And I want to start by checking if the PowerPoint works, which it does. I want to start by mapping out uh, very briefly where we are, in my view, in uh, climate politics. I don't know how well you can see, um, hopefully well enough. Um, in 2023, um, as uh, the United Nations recent report tells us that we are unfortunately on the pathway to three uh, degrees Celsius global warming rather than the Paris commitments to, to two, uh, two Celsius, uh, we are seeing uh, very rapid progress in some parts of the world in the adoption of um, renewable energies and in the creation of renewable energy uh, capacity, much faster uh, in China which is, uh, th than uh, the European Union um, in terms of pace uh, or, and, and volume, or the United States. What is also remarkable and interesting, I, I will uh, to talk about this in... Uh, Later on, what is interesting is that China is also picking up very rapidly uh, um, production capacity and export markets in electric vehicles, in cars. You'll see that vertical red line there, um, quite remarkable and quite scary from, for some European Union countries. Um, as we speak, um, lots of uh, climate activists and national governments are going to COP28, and Larry Fink, who's important part of my story, Larry, Larry Fink is uh, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. Um, he, uh, Bloomberg tells us, he's got, coming back to COP28 after he snubbed COP27 in Egypt. He was there uh, in, in uh, Scotland at COP26. Uh, so uh, private finance is returning in very, with, in, in very significant uh, scale to uh, climate negotiations. And the United States, uh, after uh, a period during the presidency of uh, Donald Trump, where it was a, basically a non-actor in, in international climate politics, uh, has, with the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, uh, introduced what is uh, known to be as the, the largest climate inv uh, bill in the, the history of the United States. At, at least this is how Elizabeth Warren describes it. Uh, and uh, supporters of the Biden administration are saying, look at that vertical line, uh, investment in manufacturing is picking up again after a long period of the industrialization in the, in the United States. So lots of things are, are moving um, outside the European Union. I want to take you back now to the European Union and to my very poor Dutch. Um, I, I studied uh, in, in The Hague 20 years ago, so if I misunderstand <laughs> what those graphs say, please correct me. Uh, but what we, we know and we see not just in, in the Netherlands but in other European countries is that climate uh, issues that were very, very prominent to uh, uh, that were very prominent and constituted a very important source of political pressure, they are a little bit on the uh, back foot now for reasons that I will uh, elaborate in a second. But I think if you look at uh, how Dutch voters think about how should we, the burden of decarbonization or of transition to a green economy, how should it be distributed? If my Dutch is correct, they think the, the largest or the broadest shoulders should bear it, and those broader shoulders should be businesses or private capital, the governments, consumers, um, and some of them think the European Union as well. Uh, what is also remarkable at this particular conjuncture in the European Union, 
is what uh, the Financial Times uh, editorial yesterday described as an overzealous debt break. Basically, German uh, fiscal policy is in, is in chaos. It's threatening their uh, decarbonization strategy. And of course, it has very important implications at European level because the, the Germany has very particular fiscal preferences uh, uh, that basically entrench uh, austerity and create or reduce uh, fiscal space for um, decarbonization. So, how do we think about all these kind of disparate uh, dynamics with the European Union's ambitious green policies on, on the back foot, with the US and China uh, engaged in what, what many described as great power geopolitic, uh, geopolitical struggles? Um, my uh, suggestion is we should go back to um, the distinguished non-orthodox, non-mainstream economies that we're celebrating today. Uh, and in a, thousand, uh, in a 2004 paper that he co-wrote with uh, Bill Mitchell, uh, he described a Br Brussels-Frankfurt consensus, and there is a very long quote there um, that you, I'm, I'm not going to read it to you, but the basic uh, understanding of that quote was, is probably familiar to most students of European Union uh, macroeconomic policy. And the idea of this Brussels-Frankfurt consensus is basically uh, the European Union or the macroeconomic architecture of the European Union is founded in price stability, is founded in the primacy of, of uh, independent uh, central bank targeting inflation, is very much insisting on low public debt, very much insisting on, on fiscal austerity, and all these things together, this combination of prudent monetary policy and conservative or austere fiscal policy, it will give us growth, it will give us investment, it will give us national savings that will promote private investment. Um, it's a great story of the, the, the state doesn't have to do very much besides maintaining the important role of price signals, allowing price signals to move, to, to um, uh, create conditions for markets to optimally allocate resources, right? And uh, you will see there, um, uh, uh, Jan uh, describes this as uh, an ideology of inflation control, and I wanted to put it in your minds because it's very important when we discuss um, uh, macroeconomic policy in general and macroeconomics in general, that we recognize that there is a political economy and the politics be behind the, the assumptions and the choices that we make in macro. Uh, they stressed the failure to use fiscal policy in appropriate ways to create jobs. And I'll tell you a story of how the failure to create fiscal policy, to use fiscal policy to de decarbonize is a very part of the, uh, important part of the story of why the European Union's decarbonization po policies are on the back foot. And they also talked about the, the restrictions that a particular approach to price stability places on uh, uh, the determinants of economic competitiveness. And they said, well, you can't have competitive currencies if uh, the ECB doesn't want to intervene in currency markets. And this is important, I will show you, because there is a resurgence in green industri in industrial policy in a green form, and this resurgence uh, has brought back very old in many ways, but now very relevant debates about how do we do, how do we create competitiveness uh, beyond uh, assuming that the market will, will generate it. So um, I want to make three arguments today, building on this um, uh, Muisken critique of the Brussels uh, Frankfurt consensus. And the first one is that green capitalism, as we have it at the moment, is a macrofinancial issue. When we think about decarbonization, we have to think about the combinations of macroeconomic policy institutions and, uh, and financial um, system that we have, because that, in general, because money and, and credit are very important strategic institutions of capitalism, and they dictate uh, or they create the conditions for particular economic uh, trajectories. I would, I would argue that this continued, continuous dominance of this Brussels-Frankfurt consensus that creates a particular macroeconomic architecture, it leads to climate politics and climate policies that is organized around carrots, 
And I want to, you to remember this around carrots for big capital or subsidies for private investment rather than a carrots and sticks approach. And I will show you that the European Union had, for a brief period of time, while Donald Trump was president, we had a carrots and sticks approach. And in my mind, that was a much more effective way of organizing decarbonization. And it was more effective because we have to, if we assume, if we accept that to me what is a, a very clear, compelling argument that decarbonization requires massive structural transformation of our economies, we can't only rely on bribing private companies to, to take us into the right place. And I want to talk about this. The, the, you will see that this new relationship uh, between uh, the, the state and the creation of these subsidies, this new relationship between the state and, and capital is, is described as de-risking. This is not my term. This is the term that the European Commission is using, that the United States government is use, using, that by the economics is using. And there are two main uh, critiques or two main sets of discontents that this um, approach to decarbonization creates. The first one is that it's too slow, for particularly for the European Union under the uh, Brussels-Frankfurt consensus. We, we basically can compete with, with great power, in great power politics. It's also too unjust in the sense that it creates uh, losers, it creates um, uh, political polarization, and it leads to an anti-climate politics that is basically slowing down uh, uh, or reducing the possibilities for governments to push ahead with um, um, ambitious climate policies. And I think the Netherlands is, a, is an excellent example of this argument. Um, I've read about, <laughs> about it. I'm very happy to, to, to um, develop it and, and maybe learn from you. And the more provocative one um, is the final point that we can't do just transitions. In other words, we can't do transitions that do not penalize or that, that do not have regressive distributional politics. We can't do them without strategic planning and without the state taking a very significant share of economic activity uh, on its balance sheet. Uh, and not just economic activity, but uh, um, green infrastructure. So how do, how do we update this critique of the, um, the Brussels Frankfurt consensus? I've been working with several other colleagues on a theoretical framework called critical macrofinance. Um, and what critical macrofinance does, it takes insights from post-Keynesianism, particularly Hyman Minsky but se and several others, to argue that uh, or to explore the way in which changes in private finance are go, go hand in hand with changes in the macroeconomic institutions of the state. That is, uh, there, are, there is a coevolution of the state and that coevolution, when we think about it, and I'll show you in a second what it means in terms of pressures on the state to do economic policy differently, macroeconomic policy, both uh, fiscal and monetary policy. The, the, the path of that change is, is political, and that's where the critical comes in, in the sense that, that the pathway uh, is produced through political and ideological struggle. And this is why I was um, highlighting the idea uh, uh, of the ideology of price stability because it reminds us that economic policy choices and macroeconomic policy choices are very hard political uh, choices that are uh, uh, shaped by political struggle. Now, uh, there are several pillars of the critical macrofinance approach. I won't discuss the money part, um, innovations in forms of money because they're not necessarily relevant here. But the, the, the single most important change in, in financial system that we have had over the past few decades is a global shift towards market-based finance where institutional capital, and I'll show you in a second what I mean by that, institutional capital becomes increasingly larger and increasingly important in the allocation of credit flows across economies. And there are several authors who have worked on it. Um, a good way to think about it is to look, compare the existing stock of bank credit to the assets managed by institutional capital. And what you see there, for example, Netherlands is now at 400% of GDP institutional capital. And when we think about institutional capital, we think about uh, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, uh, high net worth individuals that are organizing their assets by allocating funds to, you see here for, for Netherlands, for example, to bonds, equity, cash and um, deposits, to private equity funds, 
and several other uh, financial institutions. And the, the, the very important and rapid growth, and I, I will ask you to ignore here Luxembourg and Ireland because they are, uh, for many purposes, tax havens, but we see the same pattern across high-income countries, both in Europe and the United States, and they reflect the withdrawal of the welfare state. They reflect the transition in the way that we organize uh, the, the societal contract away from the state providing public uh, uh, goods against future uncertainty like health, like, edu like um, uh, uh, retirement, a move from the state towards the market. So you have very significant uh, pension funds um, or very, very large uh, pools of, um, insurance, of insurance companies. Now, why does this matter? Very briefly, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate more on this in the future, um, this glut of institutional capital um, that is grow has grown very rapidly, and it has grown very rapidly on the back of the withdrawal of the welfare state, but also on the back of increasingly large shadow banking activity and aggressive risk taking and leveraging in shadow banking. Um, we have seen very significant changes in the nature of the state uh, um, institutions or in the, acti in the uh, policies that uh, state institutions have been undertaking recently. And I, dis I describe this as the rise of the, de of the de risking state. In other words, uh, market-based finance creates new forms of financial instability. Uh, if you think about the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the run on the repo market, it, it creates new demands for stabilizing um, repo-based finance. It, it creates very important and politically controversial demands for central banks to intervene in government bond markets, and that's why we had quantitative easing, and I'll show you in a second, that's why we had the ECB doing what we call market maker of last resort. And for the decarbonization story, the rise of these very large institutional uh, capital pools that require new assets to generate uh, uh, cash flows and to generate profits it creates a new uh, pressure, structural pressures on the state to create new asset classes, like green asset classes, like housing, education, nature, to fill this portfolio glut. So the state uh, views under the uh, the state views these existing pools of institutional capital as a very significant uh, um, uh, source of credit that can be tapped for um, uh, decarbonization policies. Now, um, let me give you an example for um, government bonds of why I think uh, we have had very massive changes in how we do central banking that uh, they usually go unnoticed unless we are in periods of crisis. And if you remember 2020, uh, uh, the COVID crisis, or if you remember 2008, these are very important. What central banks do, besides moving interest rates, which is a standard story we have, uh, independent central banks under the ideology of price stability that in theory should prevent them from undertaking large interventions in government bond markets, they have done so on a very massive scale, not because we are returning to some Keynesian paradigm of fixing uh, sovereign bond prices, of subordinating monetary policy to fiscal policy, but because financial stability requirements mean, mean that central banks have to make government bonds or to preserve their investability. In other words, they have to preserve their uh, function as a, as a safe asset in the financial system. Uh, and I call this monetary de-risking in the sense that we are seeing, we have seen over the past 15 years, very significant shifts in the way that central banks do monetary policy, particularly in unconventional times, through what we call market maker of last resort function. And, if you remember the debates around Christine Lagarde saying that we are not here to target uh, or to close spreads uh, in 2020 when we all worried that that would mean a sovereign bond crisis again or sovereign bond pressures in, in the Italian government bond market, central banks have, she was forced to accept that the ECB is basically there to close spreads, not because the ECB wanted to help Italy, but because, the, because uh, otherwise we would have very significant financial stability pressures given the reliance of these institutional um, investors 
on uh, uh, government bonds. The same story, if you remember this year, in March 2023, was a very exciting uh, month for people like me who study money, uh, since we had a, a nearly uh, a banking crisis in the United States, and the US Federal Reserve responded to that banking crisis by basically overturning 40 years of uh, conservative treatment of, of government collateral, which basically says you have to take collateral at market prices because otherwise you create moral hazard and you, you um, support governments too much. The US Federal Reserve said, no, I will take out the market from, the go from government collateral, and it accepted it at par value. I'm very happy to elaborate on this. This is a very radical moment in many ways for, for conservative central banks. And it had to do with the structural pressures of a market-based financial system that requires new forms of uh, central bank uh, interventions that I call uh, de-risking. What is more interesting for the story that I'm going to tell you tonight is um, the fact that under, or the, 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 the provocation that under the ideology of price stability, that is um, um, in a sense pressuring a particular a view of fiscal space or reducing fiscal space, uh, we have uh, governments are turning to this institutional uh, capital glut in order to help finance or uh, mobilize this institutional capital uh, institutional glut to mobilize uh, to mobilize it in order to finance new um, uh, to, to advance new uh, decarbonization projects and what is the narrative under which we hear about this we, we hear these calls for mobilizing private capital. The idea is, and, and if you Google BlackRock uh, and, and um, uh, de-risking, you will hear the same uh, logic, is we don't have enough public money to finance, for example, uh, new schools or new care homes or new uh, um, uh, child care homes. Uh, we don't have enough public money, but what, what we can do is we can uh, ask the private sector to do it for us. Uh, the private sector doesn't do it through, directly through market processes because the risk returns are not correct. In other words, risks are too high or returns are too low, uh, risk-adjusted returns are too low. And what is needed is for the state to come in and take some of the risks from the private sector, make any new project that has a public policy aspect to it to make it uh, investable, to make it profitable, uh, profitable for uh, private investors. So this is what the state does under the pressures of market-based finance, it makes projects investable. And that it can do that in very many different ways. Uh, I won't take you through all of them, but the idea is that the state takes some risks from the private sector onto its balance sheet, which is a form of subsidizing private profitability. It can be political risk, demand risk, for example, for highways. It can be currency risk, uh, liquidity risking of bond markets. It can be environmental risk in, in uh, nature-based uh, asset classes. And what this does fundamentally it is a form of both privatizing public goods and subsidizing the private sector who are the owners of this, uh, or the operators of this uh, privatized uh, public goods, because making projects investable means creating predictable cash flows for housing, schools, for water, for renewable energy, for the debates we have currently on green hydrogen in the European Union. Um, for nature uh, as an asset class. And let me give you the example of housing, because I think this is um, quite important for debates, not just in, in the Netherlands, but across the European Union. Uh, in a recent report we've done for the European Parliament, which I hope you can, you can see there, we map the ways in which uh, uh, institutional investors or institutional landlords that are pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, uh, and other asset managers, the ways in which they could, can become institutional landlords, that is, that they can uh, uh, receive either direct, be direct owners of housing or they can receive um, uh, cash flows from uh, uh, financial instruments issued to finance these, and we, uh, that goes both for private ownership, because the mortgages that are created uh, uh, for private ownership can uh, be securitized or bonds can be issued and those, uh, um, th those bonds end up in institutional portfolios, 
It can be through private equity, uh, for example, in resi uh, residential mortgage funds or uh, residential uh, or, or larger real estate funds. And I wanted to show you an example here that I think makes it a little bit more um, uh, comprehensible. Uh, if we look, for example, at uh, the distribution of housing assets in institutional portfolios, you will see that Amsterdam is the second largest. This is 2021 numbers. It's very difficult to get this, these figures uh, because they are not reported. There are not many statistics on it. This is a project done by several uh, civil society organizations in, in Europe. Uh, and we, we did the report for the uh, Green Group in the European Parliament by using uh, prime, um, data from a private provider called Prequin. And what you see here, for example, in Amsterdam, uh, private uh, or institutional landlords hold together around 23.4 billion in um, residential housing. Um, and the largest uh, um, institutional landlord in, in uh, Europe, in Amsterdam, and also Berlin, is Blackstone, a large private equity uh, company based in the United States that uh, is running or is, is, uh, is, uh, owns housing through a private equity fund. And you will see here, and, and this is an important part of the story that I'm telling, you will see that behind Blackstone uh, are several pen, uh, public pension funds from the United States. To put it differently, the large demand from institutional capital for profitable placements, for profitable asset classes, is basically leading to um, the increasing financialization, if you want, of, of housing or the increasingly large footprint of institutional investors in uh, housing across large European capitals. And of course, we, we know that this is a problem in the sense that these institutional investors are expecting cash flows, and that means they will increase rents and they will create pressures in terms of both distribution, but in terms of also of the makeup of the uh, groups that can uh, access this, this housing. And in the United States, we have very good evidence that is basically pushing out uh, minority groups from, uh, from uh, housing areas and, and turning them whiter and whiter. And I, I wanted to show you that uh, the Dutch pension funds are very important parts of this story because Dutch pension funds are, this is the, uh, the ABP is the, I think is the education and something and government pension fund. They make very significant allocations to, to uh, real estate. And so our pension funds, my pension fund in the United Kingdom is the same. They are contributing to the push for um, the state to create uh, asset classes that generate predictable cash flows. In other words, to, to the privatization of, of housing and other public goods. And in, in that report, we, we show in detail the m ways in which the state is making it easier for institutional landlords to get larger shares of our housing stock through what we call regulatory de-risking, which is making easier for um, financial institutions to hold um, uh, financial instruments that are uh, uh, related to housing asset classes through fiscal de-risking. This is basically, uh, there are tax incentives that governments are giving for institutional landlords like Blackstone to buy more uh, housing. And the, the European Central Bank can do the same by providing very special treatment for um, mortgage-backed securities issue, uh, issued by these institutional landlords in order to increase their uh, portfolio of, of housing. Okay, so this is, this is an important part of, of the story in the sense that what we have seen in the political economy of the, Euro, uh, of the European Union over the past decades, with the growing importance of institutional cash pools, we have th seen the state making it, or uh, l reducing the, the social contract with its citizens that included housing for a very long time, and making it easier for institutional landlords um, to uh, become important uh, providers of in many ways, very restrictive uh, housing. Now, how does this matter for my story about uh, green capitalism? Well, it matters because the same dynamics of the state subsidizing private investors to deliver on public policy priorities, the same dynamic we can observe in uh, the decarbonization agenda. And I want to spend the next mm, 20 minutes 
15 minutes in, describing what I would call a North Atlantic convergence to a market-led, state-subsidized climate politics, where the state is increasingly reliant on private finance and also private capital to uh, decarbonize with what I would argue very, not very uh, impressive uh, either material results or distributional uh, politics. And let me start by reminding you uh, or, or noticing that after the global financial crisis and with the increasing uh, pressure of organized climate groups and climate activism, Fridays for Future is a very good example, we had European politicians from across the political spectrum recognizing that uh, climate is a serious issue that requires a very significant um, uh, structural transformation and state intervention beyond carbon prices, right? The standard uh, uh, response, particularly from conservative groups, used to be if only we raise carbon prices, the market would do its job because price signals would be better, the externalities of climate would be internalized, we don't need to do anything else. Well, political um, uh, agreement around carbon prices is very difficult for reasons that are very obvious. If you think about it, just increasing carbon prices is very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very sick, um, um, sure recipe for a, a government losing power very quickly. We can see with Gillette John, we can see, uh, in, I suppose, in Dutch politics as well, if you think about the, the farmers' movement, imposing a, a, a high, very high carbon prices is not politically viable um, without me uh, measures to ensure uh, um, that the market is in one way or another accompanied by, uh, in this structural transformation. So what we have had in the European Union since 2015 roughly is a European Green Deal. Um, to my mind, it's a very important uh, moment in European climate politics because it brings in something that is pretty obscure, but I think very, very important, which is the sustainable finance taxonomy. I, I used to go to Brussels for meetings uh, on the sustainable finance taxonomy, and there used to be rooms of a thousand people uh, or, um, listening to European Commission, and the, usually uh, uh, President Macron from France would come because France had a particular interest in this. And out of these 1,000 people, 850 were finance lobbyists who were really, really worried about the fact that the European Union was starting to think about a system to uh, not only encourage green finance or in, uh, investment in green activities, but to penalize uh, dirty activities to penalize carbon fi financiers. This is, I think, uh, it's important, and we saw it not in, only in the sustainable finance taxonomy, which was negotiated through a very long political process, and it ended up in, a, in for many climate activists in a very uh, problematic place. Um, so we had a sustainable finance taxonomy that says, well, we need to identify which activities are green. And then once we identify that, then we create a, a, a regulatory framework around um, the financial flows that are supporting these green activities. But we also had a dirty taxonomy as a plan. It's never happened. It was the European Council did ask for it. But the European Commission finally, uh, well, uh, I think the consensus in, in the European Commission among technocrats who wanted this dirty taxonomy is that there is absolutely no political appetite for a dirty taxonomy anymore. Um, in, by 2022, 2023. And so this is important, and this is why it ha there were so many finance lobbyists in, the, in, in Brussels, in the European Parliament, when the sustainable finance taxonomy was discussed. It's important because the European Union was prepared to put in place a, a comprehensive approach for, say, for saying, if you lend to Shell, we will make it much more expensive for you. We will penalize you if you lend to Shell, if you're BlackRock or if you're uh, ABN AMRO or, or whatever European bank, we will have to make it more expensive for you uh, to do this because that's a way of redirecting financial flows and credit activity from dirty to green. And you will see in a second that this is in many ways probably the most ambitious uh, plan to, to redirect financial flows that we've had uh, in uh, North Atlantic countries. My, the other important uh, heroes of the story, and I'm saying this as a student of, of central banks, was the European Central Bank, who even before 
Madame Lagarde came uh, as a president. She is sometimes described as Madame Climate in a derogatory way. I'm, I'm, I'm not using it in that way. But uh, by two, 2018, Benoit Couret, who was a, a, the a French member of the um, executive board, was arguing that while conservative critics do not recognize this, it, uh, climate is a, a very important part, not a secondary objective, not within the secondary um, uh, mandate of the European Central Bank, but within the primary mandate. That is, if you wanted, if the Central Bank did price stability and was worried about price stability, it had to take measures to um, uh, decarbonize. Oh. It had to take measures to decarbonize monetary policy. And that's important because it means to, to take measures to decarbonize the financial system and to decarbonize monetary policy, you don't need a change in mandate. You're already bound by the primary mandate of price stability, by the ideology of price stability. You're already bound to, do, uh, to decarbonize. And the next step in this, um, in this uh, transformation of the central bank towards the carrots and sticks approach came in 2021 when Isabel Schnabel, the German member, and it's very important for, the, for those who are familiar with the complicated poli uh, macrofinancial politics of the European Union, it was important that he was the German member who said, yes, um, not only uh, that um, climate is a, is a primary mandate issue, a price stability issue, but very important, we already are our monetary policy uh, operations already have a carbon bias in them. Because, uh, and she argued, well, we follow the principle of market neutrality in monetary policy, particularly un in unconventional monetary policy. By following this principle of market neutrality, we basically, when we buy corporate bonds, we follow the existing stocks that are traded in the corporate bond market. So if the, if the bond market only trades shell bonds, the ECB only buys Shell. And of course, if the ECB only buys Shell, and I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but fossil fuel issuers are very important uh, um, in the corporate bond market, the ECB, based by following market neutrality, was basically providing excessive subsidies to, um, to, uh, to um, fossil fuel companies and to, to uh, climate laggards uh, more generally. So the argument that Isabel Schnabel made was, well, we have to give up market neutrality one way or another, and we have to correct the carbon bias. And uh, I will show you later on, that came with probably the most, one of the most innovative uh, measures to decarbonize monetary policy, which, was, uh, which is called tilting, uh, a, a framework for the ECB to change credit flows, to penalize uh, dirty issuers, and to reward green issuers. And you will see this framework goes very, uh, takes a very important step in creating state capacity to um, discipline capital to reduce the systemic greenwashing in the, in the system. Unfortunately, this did not last very long. Uh, once the Biden, the Biden won the presidency, and the Biden administration started its, its climate work, what we see is a North Atlantic turn, turn to carrots. In other words, we drop the penalties on dirty capital. We only, we only keep the um, subsidies for, for green capital or for green investments. And here we, have, we start to see the use of the term de-risking more, um, uh, 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 more uh, systematically. This is from the World Bank, who first used it on a, on, a, on a regular basis under its maximizing finance for development agenda. And the argument here is, or the question here is, how do I get Wall Street to finance my renewable revolution? How do I get Wall Street to finance an increase in renewable capacity? And the idea is, you de-risk projects, you de-risk sectors, you de-risk entire countries. In other words, you as a state, you have the responsibility of taking some risks for the private sector, for these private investments to, to occur. This is the same message that John Kerry to, to, took to COP26 when he said, you have to de-risk the invent, investment in water, in electricity, in transformation. A message that the state can no longer stay, sit on the sidelines, it can no longer rely on the market to allocate resources, but it has to accelerate the transition by promoting particular types of uh, of investments. It's the same message, incidentally, in the IPCC report, the, the most recent one, and you see here somewhere where it says um, what we need to, to uh, reach our Paris Agreement goals, 
uh, we need to uh, de-risk investments. The message of de-risking is very powerful, and I will show you in a second what this means in practice. What does it mean for how we do decarbonization? And I want to spend two minutes on, I don't know if it's too small, but I will translate it for you. The, the, probably the most controversial in Europe um, economic policy initiative over the, the uh, past decades was the US Inflation Reduction Act in uh, 2022, uh, push, uh, passed by the Biden administration, which uh, very much has the logic of exporting private investment in green sectors, mostly by tax credits. That is, uh, in, in this case here, uh, for carbon-free energy investments, um, the US government gives tax credit, gives carrots to private investors of up to 70% of uh, uh, upfront investment costs. 70% is a very, very significant number. Uh, pretty much unprecedented, it created a lot of political uh, debate and uh, a lot of, I would say, outrage in European capitals that changed with time because there were some negotiations. But, and to get to 70%, the Biden administration said, well, you, we start with 6%, which is your, your rightful share. And then um, if you, for example, have um, uh, domestic content in your uh, private uh, uh, energy projects, we will give you up. To, uh, we will give you an extra 10%. If you do it in special communities, you get another 10%. If you uh, do it in low-income uh, places, you get a 20%. And if you have, uh, and that's very important, prevailing wage and apprenticeship uh, rules. So. Uh, if, you, if it's labor friendly, uh, which is, the, for example, what Tesla is not, but if it's labor friendly, you get an additional 24% tax credit. So it, it builds in all these carrots. It doesn't say you ha it, it has to be labor friendly. You have to do it with unions. It says you can do it with unions or you can do it without unions. If you do it with unions, we will give you an additional 24% tax credit. So this is a system that is this, uh, 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 a green industrial policy that is designed to bribe private capital into uh, the policy priorities of the Biden administration. For example, this 24%, I spent a lot of time debating with Biden um, uh, economy, with uh, supporters of Biden, Biden economics because they say this is a very prog progressive green industrial policy. It's progressive because look, you get 24% uh, uh, tax credit if you uh, include friendly labor uh, provisions, but of course, uh, that is completely at the latitude of the private investors. And, and actually they didn't, most of them went into Republican states. Some people say by design. What matters here is that this is a de-risking strategy in the sense that unlike the traditional industrial policy in what we know to be the developmental state literature, where, for example, uh, Korea is a very good uh, case study of this. Alice Samsden wrote a, a wonderful book about it. She argued that for the Korean uh, government to have the success that it had in industrial policy, it had to work with a combination of carrots and sticks. It had to reward good performers, but also discipline bad performers, because it couldn't rely on market signals uh, to, uh, to achieve its strategic priorities at, at sectoral level. We don't have this in the uh, US uh, Inflation Reduction Act. There are no what Alice Amden, Amden calls compulsive institutions to discipline private capital, to make sure that it stays on, on target and it stays aligned with the strategic priorities of the state. However, that doesn't mean that it's not at least initially successful. If you look here at uh, manufacturing investments by technology, those uh, numbers, rapidly increasing numbers are very impressive by, by US standards. The, the costs, the fiscal costs of this de-risking are also very significant. Uh, this is estimates from um, uh, US um, uh, Congress um, uh, or body, and, and it shows that by 2025, and of course all this now comes with the brackets of what will happen if Trump wins the elections. In theory, many people argue not much, but we, we will see. By 2025, there is an estimate that uh, this tax credits, this fiscal de-risking for uh, private investments in uh, uh, green areas will reach almost 100 billion uh, US dollars, which is very significant uh, uh, fiscal resources. 
Unfortunately, the European Union, when, when, was, when the European Union was confronted with this very massive fiscal subsidies for uh, industrial policy, first uh, responded by proposing a European sovereignty fund. And this European sovereignty fund is very interesting, uh, mostly because it doesn't exist anymore. It was a very short project of the European Commission. And the European, uh, the Thierry Breton last year, the Euro European uh, Commissioner for the Internal Market, who was in charge of designing what we now have as a European level net uh, industrial policy called the Net Zero Industrial Act. He said, um, we need a fiscal, or, or we need fiscal capacity at European level to be able to match this, whatever it takes, fiscal spending that the US um, has um, um, deployed. And um, because of the comp uh, intricacies of which countries in the European Union can afford, given the Brussels Frankfurt consensus, which countries, even with a suspension of state aid, uh, can afford to actually provide fiscal subsidies, uh, and we know the answer is Germany and France, more or less. Uh, to avoid this intra-European Union competition, which is very damaging for the European uh, uh, spirit, we need to create this European sovereignty fund that will help de-risk investments in future technologies and industrial production capacities. So again, de-risking is a, a standard discourse. This is the way in which the European elites in Brussels are thinking about how to do industrial policy. Unfortunately, um, uh, we, for, for uh, lots of reasons that have to do with uh, the level of public debt to GDP and the, the ideology of price stability in the European Union, uh, this European Sovereignty Fund never actually kicked off the ground and, and it's now dead and, um, or it's, it's much smaller. Now, why does this uh, matter? Well, because if we compare um, the European Union Green Industrial um, uh, Plan, with the US Inflation Reduction Act, what we see is a very, they are similar in the logic of what is the new relationship between state and, and private capital that will dr drive this uh, green capitalism in the sense that it uses more or less the same instruments, only the scale uh, is different. Um, there are um, no instruments to make sure that the recipients of state subsidies will continue with their plans for uh, investment to keep us on a track to, to Paris or on a, on, a, on a track to two degrees Celsius. The only mechanism for discipline that I've heard of, uh, it's, it's in my view very controversial, it's in the view of many climate activists also very controversial, is carbon capture and storage, the idea that eventually you will force the polluters to basically uh, pay for carbon capture and storage, and that will become a market mechanism to reduce uh, um, uh, CO2 emissions or to reduce uh, the carbon footprint of, of their operation. And I just wanted to, to uh, compare this with the, Europe to the US CHIPS Act, the other part of uh, industrial policy that was revived in the United States for reasons of national security. Uh, and this is uh, directed at improving the semiconductor manufacturing capacity of the United States, uh, given geopolitical competition with China. And what you say, see there in the US CHIPS Act is a state that is much more willing to tell capital what to do, to tell private companies, you need to do this and that. You cannot, for example, uh, you cannot do uh, share buybacks, which is uh, uh, an endemic problem in um, um, contemporary capitalism, uh, we will monitor, we will make sure that your investments are the kind of investments we, we want with prior due diligence. There will be milestones, a whole institutional apparatus to make sure that semiconductor investment is aligned with the national security priorities of the, uh, of the United States. And that to me is an important part of how we should think about decarbonization in general because it, it kind of reveals the extent to which the state, when it is driven by political coalitions with, with, where fiscal hawks are not so important, but geopolitical hawks accept that fiscal policy needs to, uh, and in general the state needs to be more robust, then what we get is a much more uh, robust or, or a much more elaborate uh, uh, institutional mechanism for ensuring that private businesses deliver on uh, the strategic uh, priorities of the state. And I, I, I describe this as the big green state just to um, uh, uh, evoke 
uh, the, the, the very large transformation that is necessary not only in private activity, but in the way that the state is do, um, does monetary, fiscal, and industrial policy for, for decarbonization. Unfortun unfortunately, again, with the arrival of the Biden administration and the weakening of the European, of the, of the political appetite for a more robust state intervention, what we have now is a lot of de-risking. If you look, for example, at the green hydrogen plant, plants, this is, uh, the European Union is taking very significant steps to, steps to create a green hydrogen market in Europe. It's all based on, on, on carrots. The electricity market, um, Design reform, I've now become, I'm not an expert in electricity markets, but I've had to read a lot just to understand what is the political logic there. And it is the same logic of the risking. It's saying if we want to basically uh, promote or accelerate renewable energy adoption, what we have to do is the state has to guarantee demand through um, uh, uh, power purchasing agreements, and it has to guarantee a certain carbon price through contracts for difference, particularly in green hydrogen. I can elaborate what contracts for difference are. They are, again, mechanisms for de-risking private investment for the state to assume some risks in order to uh, promote um, private investment. The Net Zero Industrial Act is, is the same story. The, the European Union is trying to promote uh, uh, certain strategic sectors, uh, basically, um, uh, in renewable energy, in carbon capture and storage, again, it's promoting them with uh, subsidies. And finally, the European Central Bank has also moved into the direction after designing a very complicated, very interesting system for tilting the corporate bond portfolio uh, last week. Uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, together with the president of the International, uh, International Energy um, Agency and the president of the European Investment Bank, they wrote this climate-proof European uh, project uh, or, or agenda. And I highlighted for you there how the, how the European Central Bank is thinking about how to its role in climate-proofing um, uh, the European economy, and the idea here is, the logic here is de-risking. It's no longer talking about uh, penalties on dirty issuers. It's no longer talking about tilting. What it says, we need to tailor financing solutions and guarantees to alleviate the risks attached to highly innovative private instruments. This is the state basically saying we have to bribe uh, private finance into doing less uh, uh, dirty uh, credit and doing more uh, green credit. Now, just to summarize, uh, what do we, when I think about green capitalism, what do I mean? Uh, uh, or uh, what does it look like in Europe? It's, it's not changing the Brussels Frankfurt consensus on price stability. We, have, we are in a period of uh, uh, very gr rapidly growing um, uh, interest rates. Uh, the idea is that you have to mobilize private investment in green policy priorities by using all the instruments that the state has in order to take risks from the private sector and hoping that the private sector would, uh, would deliver. There is no massive public investment in public green infrastructure or industries. This is not a state that increases its footprint in economic activity to help the reallocation of resources. Uh, it's a state that doesn't use sticks, it only uses carrots. Now, why is this a problem? I mean, most of us in the room might think, well, maybe this is exactly what we need to do. Why shouldn't the state help private companies do better? Why shouldn't the state, I mean, some of us in the room have some Keynesian origins, why shouldn't the state activate private investment uh, and allow the market, once it, the state activated, and allow the market to, to do its magic and uh, give us decarbonization? And, my, my argument, and, and I think it, it, it is born in, in the empirical developments over the past six months to a year, is that this is not enough. It, it, it does trigger reallocation of resources, but given the urgency of the climate crisis, and here, if you don't buy that we are in, an, uh, in a, a moment of crisis, then maybe this is a different conversation, but if you buy the arguments of every cl climate, large climate organization, including the UN, that we are on a pathway to three, Celsius rather than on, on the Paris goals, then delegating the pace and nature of the decarbonization to private capital is not going to take us very far. And there are three reasons for this. The first one is that we know there is systemic greenwashing. In other words, 
when costs or significant uh, private finance likes to pretend that it's greener than it is. This is, this is absolutely not controversial. The European Union's um, sustainable finance agenda was based in reducing greenwashing. It hasn't done a lot of it, but it's not a controversial idea. The second, and this is relevant for the European project, it strains intra-European relationships simply because only relying on the fiscal capacity of the state uh, means that uh, you're forcing countries in the European periphery that have less fiscal capacity to do less of green industrial policy, and you're basically st saying, well, you know, in the end, if only, well, Germany, I used to say if only Germany, but Germany with its debt break now has broken my argument. If only France uh, uses its, the suspension of state aid, well, that's very unfair, because why should all green industrial policy benefits go to only one country? We have been through the European sovereign debt crisis. We know how bad it is uh, when these uh, intra-European uh, tensions get high. I think probably the most important one, so leaving aside the, the questions of, of intra-European strains, is that this reliance on steering the price signal, because this is what the de-risking does, it steers the price signal into a direction of, of, that the state desires. It says, uh, I will make it more profitable for you to invest in these strategic sectors. Here are the carrots, please take them if you want, if you don't, uh, that's fine. The problem is that the, the price signal in green markets is not only determined by the risking activities, but it comes from the different sorts of pressures, right? So for example, monetary tightening can, or higher interest rates, higher costs of financing can disrupt these attempts of the state to channel uh, uh, in private investment into, into green activities. And we have seen that very starkly uh, in the renewable energy sector where uh, the renewable energy sector, despite massive support from the Biden administration, despite massive support from uh, European uh, Union, they are not having a very good year. In, in fact, fossil fuel companies have had a marvelous year this year, the year where we had the worst climate uh, uh, readings in probably in living memory, as far as I know, it has been a very good year for, for fossil fuel companies. As you see here, the S&P Global Clean Energy Index is tanking quite, quite uh, significantly. And we also know that this, the, the, the market mechanisms to de-risk private investment are not working. In other words, uh, UK offshore wind development, uh, the auctions, for the state to give subsidies to private investors are failing because they are arguing the pri prices are too low. And what we get is a green capital strike, as my friends from the Commonwealth argue it, where private investors are saying, well, you have to give us higher returns, otherwise we won't invest. So you have a little bit of a, a bargain there, uh, a strategic game where the state is dedicating more and more resources to, to the risking. Uh, the same for Germany, the same for the, the, for the United States, everywhere where financing costs are increasing, private investors are asking for more money or for, for more carrots in order to undertake these this investments. And obviously that's a complicated way to go, uh, to go about it because it requires uh, higher fiscal resources. We also know that it's not just about renewable energy capacity, but also the strategic sectors that the US is targeting with its green industrial policy, they're not doing very well either. Again, uh, South Korean electrical vehicle battery makers, which were recipients of very significant uh, state subsidies, they are saying, well, actually, there is not enough demand. We are, we, 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 we are not receiving enough uh, uh, profits or, or the profit expectations that we had from the US IRA are actually not matched and we're going to start to uh, shrink our, our investments. So the state's attempt to bribe capi private capital into doing uh, green capitalism are not very effective unless you put a lot of um, fiscal resources into it. And we see that also I don't know if, how much you can see it on the, on the graph. We see that uh, although there is a, a rapidly increasing, so this is 2023 and 2022 share of renewable energy in total energy in, across the European Union, uh, we see that simply the pace is not there. It's, it, we, we need uh, the um, investments to occur at a much faster rate than they, than they are at the moment. And we also know from the recent reports of the um, International Energy um, Association that uh, fossil fuel investments are still, while they are shrinking, they are still very high 
for um, uh, what, what is necessary for Paris uh, alignment or for two degrees. So our turn to green capitalism for the last decade is, hasn't been uh, very successful in terms of materially delivering on the pace of decarbonization that is necessary. And secondly, and very importantly, it's the, 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 the discourse around the just transition, and the European Union will say this very regularly, we need a just transition because we need political support. We need voters to vote for uh, parties that are committed to decarbonization. We don't see, we, we don't see that um, uh, support materializing or we see it weakening precisely because uh, what we are getting is a privatization and financialization of public goods. The moment that you're asking private investors to uh, uh, invest in nature asset classes or in, or in health, in education, in um, housing, it means that somebody has to generate cash flows for these investors. And it's either the state with fiscal policy or it's regular citizens like, like you and me that uh, end up paying for it. So there is a, re a regressive distributional politics in this, in this approach. And of course, it also is fiscal space uh, in the sense that it require, requires more and more fiscal resources that could be dedicated to, uh, uh, for example, green infrastructure. Uh, and I wanted to show you several examples of even to imagine if this private equity f uh, funds that are increasing very rapidly. Some people are estimating in infrastructure, they're up to one trillion uh, US dollars. If they actually uh, got hold of our public infrastructure, it would mean more and more de facto privatization of, of a range of, of public goods. And we know, for example, from looking at health, and I, gave, I have several examples here of uh, privatized healthcare that is basically becoming much more uh, expensive for, um, for uh, regular citizens. Um, and now that I live in the United States, I also understand what, it mean, what this means in practice. I have not actually gone to the doctor yet. Whatever happens to me, I promised I will go back to the UK. Because you never, I, 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 there are 150 pages of instructions of where do I need to go and what do I need to do in order to, um, I don't know, have a tooth extracted. And this is where we're going with this logic of uh, um, health asset classes, or uh, this is where this is the direction that we're going in. And if we're not going into the, di the direction, and we probably will see this in Germany, where we're going is into what uh, uh, with Isabella Weber, who you probably know from her debates around China and her debates ar around price controls. We describe this er as carbon shock therapy. You can read it in the Financial Times Alphaville. It's, uh, you, it, uh, it's one of the best places to get free news on finance, and we call this carbon shock therapy in the, uh, to capture the possibility, which to me is very real, that governments who cannot do the re risking because of the Brussels Frankfurt consensus, because of the absence of fiscal space, what they will say is, you know what, let the market work. In other words, if relative prices change, if, China is, is, if there is a China shock in green uh, industries, for example, for, uh, for the German car industry, well, that's it. This is how the market works. Let, let shock therapy work through. Argentina is getting it. I grew up with shock therapy in Romania. This creates disorderly transitions. This is very important because disorderly transitions are very regressive in terms of distributional politics. Uh, it's, uh, it affects the uh, uh, people at the lower uh, part of the income distribution through joblessness and, again, through uh, very significant uh, austerity. Um, I, ha I don't have a, I don't know, I, I don't know what time it is. How much time do I, where, where am I? <gasps> oh, bloody hell. Why nobody stopped me? <laughs> Anyways, very quickly. Uh, this is also bad. So distributional is not just complicated for, uh, for intra-European or intra-country distributional politics, but it also creates uh, patterns of neocolonial extractivism. Global South countries are unfortunately, uh, 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 forced structurally into becoming generative generators of financial yield for my pension fund in the UK, but also importers of clean tech and, and green tech. So reproducing the same financial and structural dependency that we've had for a very long time, and which the Biden administration with his green industrial policy was supposed to put aside. I wanted to show you that this is very much the case of Indo Indonesia's just, uh, energy transition plan. It's written by the riskers. It has the logic of the risking in there. Um, and I don't think it will trigger the kind of uh, resurgence of industrial policy that the Indonesian government thinks it will. Okay, two more minutes. 
What, what, can the, what can the big green state do? There are lots of things here that politically are very difficult, but I think we have to be realistic and dream the impossible. Uh, and, and this impossible says, under the conditions of great power competition in climate politics, because this is where we are now, we are in great power uh, politics competition, uh, where, where we have climate as a national security issue, then political coalitions will include uh, geopolitical hawks to support fiscal expansion in, in favor of climate. We, we can get the US, or we can have seen the US scale up fiscal de-risking to crowd in private capital. It was a US uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and of course there are problems with it. It, it, it is also, it goes hand in hand with a lot of, uh, of uh, fossil fuel activity. It's, it could be threatened by the Biden re-election, but it's significantly more robust than a European Union green industrial deal. Whereas, and while China, with Made in China 2025, a green industrial strategy, it really can scale, or it can use its close control of, of credit flows to, to strategic sectors to achieve the same things that the United States is trying to do with the, with the IRA. And I wanted to show you here how quickly credit to infrastructure shrank and credit to manufacturing sector increased within the scope of two years. Nobody has the capacity to do this without close state control over, over finance. And I want to suggest to you, and I'll, I'll stop with this, I want to suggest to you that we still have, and we should, I don't want this to be a very bleak ending, we still have green revolutionaries and, in, uh, and pillars of state capacity in the European Union that can be reactivated that, and that we should work for. And I don't, don't know how many of you recognize that man, man there, uh, well, I, I can see some of you are nodding. This is Frank Elderson, the Dutch member of the executive board of the European Central Bank, who is very lonely these days because he is pro one of the few that still tries to do climate politics at the ECB. And he's very lonely because the, the push of conservative members against climate pol pol policies is very strong. And I think it's very strong because the ECB, with its tilting of corporate bond portfolio, has gone further than any central bank in the past 40 years to try to take control of credit flows in a way that, set, that creates state capacity to address directly corporate issuers. This is not the ECB telling banks, you shouldn't lend this much for mortgages because it creates a, a mortgage bubble. This is the ECB that had a, a framework for monitoring on a quarterly basis the, the um, um, fossil fuel or the carbon footprint of large corporate issuers in the Eurozone. This is unprecedented. Unfortunately, it's very technical, so it's very difficult for me to sell this story politically, but it is unprecedented in the creating state capacity to accelerate the structural transformation of the European uh, economy via financial flows, and that's why it only lasted nine months. It was introduced in September 2022. It was uh, abolished in uh, June, June 2023. And with this, I will finish. Um, we are still constrained by the ideology of the Brussels Frankfurt consensus. This, these constraints are, are creating both a slowdown of decarbonization and are creating significant eco economic losers that are translating into a political backlash and a vote for far-right parties across Europe who are promising to stop this climate nonsense because it, it penalizes working class people. And we have to think about how do we create some form of strategic planning. This is the reality of the, the requirements of decarbonization is that it cannot be done through market mechanisms. It needs a, a lot more state intervention. Thank you, and apologies for not noticing. I have a, a watch on my side. Thank you so much, Professor Gabor, for this eloquent lecture. I've learned a lot in in less, no, more than an hour. I never learned so much. <laughs> Thank you. We have till 9.30 for the questions, so we do some, some very short questions, and then we go for the drinks. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Um, the, obviously, the climate crisis massively raises the stakes. Um, do, do you think the government should also use carrots and sticks in normal industrial policy? In normal? Yeah, from a, from a critical perspective. I, you, by normal, you mean? Um, for example, with the, uh, relation to the, to the chips, as the US is heavily pushing. Mm. Um, so kind of to 
should the government strategize, uh, place strategic priorities on industrial investments and use carrots and sticks to achieve this? Yes, okay, so you're asking me if I think national security priorities are an important issue, uh, which to, to some extent I, I would say, I would recognize that they are, given, given the competing uh, demands on, on European fiscal space, to my mind, it is much more important to prioritize uh, decarbonization and to prioritize uh, green industrial policy, um, while also recognizing that certain things, uh, for example, um, uh, solar panels uh, are better, we better continue to import them from China. Germany did that for, for, uh, for uh, over a decade. Um, perhaps it's not a good idea to, um, to, to to stop that, uh, what is important, I think, is to, ma to make sure that we are shrinking the, the sectors with the highest uh, uh, carbon footprint. And that doesn't necessarily mean industrial policy in the traditional sense, but it means that we, we need to shrink the carbon footprint. And that, that means identifying sectors that are non-strategic or anti-strategic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um. Hello. Um, so along with the criticisms that you gave of this uh, policy, I also thought that even with all these incentives towards building green structures that is not really working as well as it should, as you pointed out, it's also not even reducing the spending and the investment on the things that are actually doing damage. So it's not doing good enough in the good things and it's not doing bad in the bad things. So what are the retorts that people that support this kind of policy even give out? Like, I find it very naive and very immediate criticisms jump out when you propose it. So what do, what do people answer? What do proponents of this strategy answer in defense? I think there are, thank you, there are three lines of, of answer. One is to say, uh, well, the European Union has carbon price, I mean, carbon prices are increasing. Uh, for, at least this is what green politicians told me in Berlin last week. Carbon prices are increasing, they will increase uh, faster in the future. Don't worry, we will get reallocation through carbon prices. The second is to say, well, you, there is no fiscal space. We have to recognize the constraint, the fiscal constraints we have. We can't afford, uh, with, particularly in the Eurozone, to reproduce the dynamics of the Stability and Growth Pact, if you want. Um, th this is as good as, as we get. We have to mobilize private investment. For, for a post Keynesian like myself, this is very interesting because if, if you have noticed, I talked for an hour and I did not say bank credit. We used to, the post Keynesians, particularly doing monetary theory, we used to talk about banks until the cows came home. Now nobody talks about banks anymore and, and, and banks' ability to create credit because we have shifted the terrain of the political debate on the, on the ground where BlackRock is very comfortable with, which is to say, how do we mobilize this? Um, so that's, that's the, I would say, the, the, the second argument. It's, it's not possible. And the third one, it's not politically feasible. As in, we cannot convince social democratic parties or the link in Germany would say, we cannot convince voters that our positive future of green public infrastructure where you can take a, a bus for free anywhere that is the, uh, the, where there are less cars, we cannot convince voters to, to approve of these plans. Therefore, we have to go with market-led mechanisms because that is where the, 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 the democracy leads us. Whether you could think these are convincing arguments or not is a different question, but these are the, the kind of answers you get. And unfortunately, these are the kind of answers that are organizing European politics at the moment. Uh, capitalism is based on growth and also green capital and uh, green capitalism still needs growth to survive. So what do you think will happen as the planet's resources are finite and growth or cash flows, as you mentioned, cannot be sustained, even though the planet replenishes, it, limit, it does so to a limited extent, and we're not giving it the time it needs. So capitalism is not sustainable in the long term. So what do you think will happen with capitalism? I mean, I, I'm not going to call for a revolution in, in the Netherlands, uh, for, uh, for an anti-capitalist revolution, although it is possible that that, that is what we need. And, and you know, I mean, on a serious note, 
the idea of strategic planning is to say, well, we have to, or we have to change the balance between state forces and capitalist forces. Whether Marxists would accept that this is realistic or, or, or possible, it's, it's a different question. Um, my worry is not that we are, we are going to get degrowth, and I think my friends uh, who do degrowth, there are some interesting arguments there. I, I, I think politically it's a dead end, um, and I'm very happy to discuss that, that further. My worry is that we will get green capitalism, but increasingly authoritarian and increasingly predisposed to uh, the kind of authoritarianism and the kind of... Uh, a exclusion of, of, of groups that we are seeing everywhere. Um, so that, in a sense, it's not my worry is that we, not that we, we don't, not that we get a, uh, I mean, I don't know if my worry, I, I grew up in, 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 in communism in Romania, so I have my skepticisms there, and I have to reconcile myself with the possibility, with, or with the idea that I could, I could live in, in post-capitalism. But having said that, my, I think the worry is that we, we are living in, in societies where uh, borders will become much t stronger, and life outside those borders will become much more, much more difficult, and there will be many more migrants dying in, in European seas uh, as a result. No, this is a cheerful way of doing this. Well, th thanks for the uh, provocative uh, speech. Uh, so this, is, this follows up on the previous question. So um, since you said there is no, let's say, uh, there, is, there is no support for a sovereign wealth fund or so European uh, sovereign uh, f fiscal space, um, there is no clear view on, on uh, let's say, uh, decarbonizing at the European level um, through something else than, uh, th than the, the carrots that you mentioned. So what would be the feasible way out, in your view, or the first steps towards the feasible way out of this, um, mm. of this issue? So does it mean we, we have to go to some form of author authoritarianism and then would that be an authoritarianism that would support decarbonization or uh, is there a way to convince the public that we should go there in a different way? Mm. I mean, yeah, thank you. That, that is a very difficult question to which I don't, I'm, I'm a political economist, not a political scientist, so I, I don't know that I have the ans answer. I just remember that in my, in, in the work that, or, or in my interactions with policymakers, because this is one of the great luxuries of studying money and, and finances that you get to talk to policymakers, and uh, what they say, including policymakers from the European Central Bank, is that people in the street is the best mobilizer of climate action at state level ever. Uh, Fridays for Future, people protesting, this is what gets, that what creates political pressure for the state to move into a more robust decarbonization strategy that doesn't only give periodic uh, carrots. Uh, how we do that at the moment, it, it's not very clear to me, but I, two years ago I was sure that Keynesianism was back because I looked at the level of public spending and the way in which the state was basically prepared to take the entire economy on its balance sheet given the COVID pandemic. I thought Keynesianism was coming back and I was so wrong that um, it kind of confirms my suspicions about our, our, my, our abilities as macroeconomists to predict anything uh, meaningfully. Uh, maybe in two years from now, people will go back to, to the street and the climate issue will become much more politically salient. Um, I, I can only hope so, the trends that I've showed you in the Netherlands, and perhaps you can explain this to me, why is it that trends in the Netherlands are hitting in a different direction, un unless it's the kind of account of, you know, a spiral of a bad climate politics, unjust climate policies, creating more political uh, polarization and support for, for climate denying uh, parties. That is, that is my sense. Um, I think what we, what we can do is the street and, and push the policy where it's possible to, to politicize these issues. And there is somebody in the room that is doing that with, with uh, students, with, with young people. And I think this is, this is where we, we have to recognize radical politics will come from, from young people and radical climate politics will, have, will come from young people. And hopefully they will be much, much more politically vocal or, or persuasive in the future. There's a question over here in the back. Um, so for your point of state ownership for public infrastructure, that's something that would be actually possible uh, even with the uh, DAP break? Like that, better? Okay. Um, and so the, the main argumentation against that is that the state 
is the worst manager of 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 uh, of, all of of undertakings. Um, is there actually like evidence around that whether the, the state is the worst worst manager? Um, I I think that it, we it, we have to consider the the fact that the the state capacity to manage things has been severely eroded over uh, p uh, past decades of of austerity and also. Uh, over past decades of ideology that said the state uh, is better to keep the state out of economic activity and out of management, and and my 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 one of my greatest um, concerns around the big green state is creating state capacity, and by that I, I don't just mean you know politicians who are ready to do things, but bureaucrats who know how to do things, and and you can look at the uh, resilience fund. Uh, politics in the European Union, and you can see there that in, in many countries, in many member states, we do not have that kind of state capacity. We don't have it in my country, in Romania. Our plan was written by McKinsey, which incidentally writes many, many different climate plans. Uh, it was written by, by McKinsey because we have, through decades of austerity, systematically eroded the capacity of, of the state and the incentives for, for clever people to work in state institutions and do po uh, policies properly and take care of state assets properly. Uh, it's, a, it's a political choice, like austerity, it's a political choice. We can, we can build state capacity in the way that um, we can build all sorts of other things. I'm, also, it's very clear from, from empirical evidence that private healthcare, I don't want to die in a, in a, in a private uh, home uh, run by private equity. It, I'd rather die in a state-owned one. Um, it's much better. Well, I would live longer. Well, I don't know if I want to do that, but I would probably live longer. Thanks. So, uh, Daniela, uh, in your story, capital controls seem to be a cornerstone of what's needed. I'm, I'm a big fan, but uh, co capital controls, although I think in the past they've proven to be super effective, are quite controversial these days, right? And they've mm -hmm. also been quite effectively uh, eradicated from a lot of uh, legal frameworks like WTO, but also EU internal market. Um, and to get that uh, straight, I think we, uh, we need quite some time because those are very messy political processes. But could you tell us a bit more which capital controls are uh, eligible and possible these days within the EU context, but actually globally more? I would also be interested to hear your opinion uh, regarding all the WTO mm. membership areas. Is there something possible there that we can do now? So intra-European Union, at least intra-Eurozone, I don't think you need capital controls. You just need the ECB to, to basically reactivate the, the policies that it had in order to redirect financial flows across the, Euro, the, the Eurozone. It's not a question of capital controls. Where there is a question of capital controls, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the audience. I didn't spend a lot of time. I, I spent some of my time thinking about Global South dynamics and the Global South story here. And what we know is that there, are, there is a kind of... A, intensely uh, bubbling um, debt crisis across many countries in the global south, which are now paying bondholders, these private bondholders that they are trying to attract into their investable or bankable projects, they are paying uh, bondholders uh, debt interest and, 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 and debt service that is often higher than what they're spending on, on their national health systems. And when you ask politicians, well, why are you doing that? Why, why are you not defaulting? The argument is always market access. Because of this powerful uh, narrative that you have to mobilize private capital, the World Bank tells them that, the IMF tells them that, the African Development Bank tells them, the Asian Development, every single large multilateral organization, including the United Nations Development Program, everybody is singing from the same hymn Sheet. I call this the Wall Street consensus, which is the idea that you need private capital to come in and build your uh, public infrastructure, build your roads, your schools, your hospitals, everything. Then, then the imperative is market access. And until we destroy the idea or we, 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 we work against the, the, this powerful narrative of market access, uh, that says you have to pay 20, you pay 20% interest rate on, on dollar debt, it's fine, but tomorrow you will be able to borrow more to pay this 20%. And, and of course, that goes hand in hand with destroying this Brussels Frankfurt consensus, however you want to call it. It is a consensus around monetary dominance that says the state can only target price stability and subordinate fiscal policy, and okay, if politicians are doing bad things, the bond market will punish them. So 
that is where, in, in a sense, your question is to me a macro financial question. You, we need to work on the level of ideas and we also need to work at the level of institutions. Capital controls were popular 10 years ago. The IMF was supporting them. Everybody, in theory, with, even within the W constraints, I think you can impose capital controls. We have many examples of that. Countries don't want to do it because they don't want to lose market access because then who is going to finance their schools? That, that's the narrative. Okay. It's 9.30, so um, I would like to suggest to end. If you have any more questions, you, you can ask them probably to Daniela at the ref there. Okay, thank you very I much. I'd like to give the floor for one minute. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this was a great presentation and a very interesting uh, 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 final uh, uh, discussion. Uh, we have a little present for you uh, to remember that you were here? No, it's actually a painting. <laughs> it's a painting of the building of, uh, of the economics department. So, uh, so I hope that you like it and that, uh, that you think back in a nice way to about Maastricht. Uh, so we'll have a couple of drinks until 10, 10 15, eh? 10, 15. 10, 15. Okay. <laughs> 10, 30, 10, 15. All right, good.